Okay, we are going to talk about the overall topic of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, but we're going to start this off with another Kennedy tragedy. The Kennedy family faces another tragedy prior to the President's assassination, and I think it's important that you know this. And then we're going to lecture for a pretty short period of time here, then we're going to watch a short video, and then we're going to move on. So we're talking about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, but we're not getting right to the assassination. We're going to talk about a lot of things that led up to it. Why did he even go to Texas in the first place? What was the philosophy for that? Why did he go to Dallas? Why did he go through a motorcade in Dallas? All kinds of things. But I want to start out with something that happened on August 6, 1963, before the President even went to Dallas. August 6, 1963. And what happened on August 6th of 1963 is Jackie Kennedy gave birth to their son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. So on, on August 6th of 1963, Jackie Kennedy gives birth to a son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. And Bouvier, just so you can refresh, is B-O-U-V-I-E-R. B-O-U-V-I-E-R. So on August 6, 1963, Jackie Kennedy gives birth to a son, Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. How many of you in here have heard of Patrick Bouvier Kennedy? How many have heard of John F. Kennedy Jr.? How many have heard of Caroline Kennedy? Okay, they're, 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 they're children. And there's a reason why you have not heard of Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, because he was born premature, and he only weighed 4 pounds 10 ounces at birth. So the baby was born premature, and he weighed only 4 pounds, 10 ounces at birth. Now, Mrs. Kennedy planned on having that child, not in a hospital so much, but she had, you know, they had a lot of money. She had private doctors and physicians, and she had her own place that she was going to birth this baby. Okay, it wasn't going to be in a public hospital so much. It was going to be with her own private people, etc. That's what happened. Well, when the baby was born, only 4 pounds, 10 ounces, she was transferred to the Children's Hospital in Boston. Okay, so she was transferred to the Children's Hospital in Boston after the birth of Patrick Kennedy, who weighed only 4 pounds, 10 ounces. So she had the baby privately, so to speak, but because of the complications in the early birth, Mrs. Kennedy and the baby were transferred to the Children's Hospital in Boston. Now you got to remember that times were different. And in those days, generally husbands didn't go with their wives and go through the all training and all that stuff. And, you know, it was just a little different. Husbands usually came and saw the wives win after the baby was born. And Kennedy was no different. Well, he found out about what had happened, and he arrived at the Children's Hospital in Boston about 8 p.m. that evening after the baby was born. So after Jackie was, was uh, transferred to the Children's Hospital in Boston, President Kennedy arrived to be with his wife and newborn about 8 p.m. that night. Well, as he got on the elevator to go up to the room, up to his wife's room, which was the, in the ICU unit of the hospital, as he got on the elevator, the doctor briefed him on what the situation was with the child. So he arrives at the Children's Hospital in Boston, a physician meets him there, they get on the elevator that's going to take the president up to his wife's room where, where the baby is, which is in the ICU unit. And the doctor briefs him on the condition of the child, which is not good. The newborn was in very grave condition. And so the president gets this word as he's going up on the elevator that his newborn son is in very tough shape, very grave condition. Well, he gets off the elevator, and on his way to Jackie's room, he happens to pass by another room on the way, and there were two little girls in there being treated for very severe burns. So as he's walking to his wife's room to check on the condition of his own child, he happens to walk by a room, and as he looks in, he sees two little girls in the room who are being treated for very severe burns. 
Well, something must have caught the president's heart there because in those days you didn't have an entourage and a million secret service around you and all that. You know, he wasn't he wasn't looking for a photo opportunity like you see sometimes now. It's a lot different game with the media. Well, when the president notices those two little girls, he stops and he asks his secret service agent, the one that was with him, Lawrence Newman, if he would try to find him some paper and a pen or pencil to write with. So as he walked by those rooms, he, he stopped and he stated to Secret Service Agent Lawrence Newman that he would like a paper and pen to write a note to each of those children. He wanted to stop and write a note to the children. So again, as the president stopped by the room, he stated to Secret Service Agent Lawrence Newman that he would like to write a note to each of those two children. Newman had a nurse retrieve paper for the president. She gave him the names of the two little girls, and he actually took the time and wrote a little note of, you know, get well or get better to each of the little girls, and gave it, you know, left it there for him, and went on his way. So a nurse retrieves paper and pencil or pen for the president. She also gave him the names of the little girls that were suffering tremendously from these severe burns, and the president wrote a a gentle note to each of the little girls and left him in the room. He then proceeds down the hallway to see his son, who unfortunately died the next day of respiratory distress of the lungs because he was so premature at birth. So the president then proceeded down the hall to see his son, who unfortunately died the next day had some respiratory problems because his lungs were very underdeveloped. Now, I want to stop here a minute and show you a video on this. And the thing I want you to concentrate on is what Lawrence Newman's recollection of this is. Because they're going to interview him, and he's going to explain this situation I just told you. And see what your reaction is. When we get done with this, then we will uh, continue the lecture. So just kind of let me get lined up here. I apologize for not having this ready, but I just like to say I ran from that soon. So... This was filmed in 1997, what I'm going to show you here. Hopefully it works right. If you could get the light. And this nation will not be fully free until all the citizens of it. This small planet, we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. It was also the summer that brought tragedy to the president and his family was in uh, August of 63 and Jacqueline Kennedy went into labor and prematurely delivered the baby Patrick. I was assigned to escort the baby up to the Children's Hospital in Boston. And about 8 o'clock that night, the president arrived. And in the meantime, we had learned, of course, the baby was 4 pounds, 10 ounces, and was in grave condition. And we uh, got into the elevator the doctor briefed the president on the condition of his son, which was not optimistic. And we got off on the ICU unit, and we passed a room where there were two delightful little girls, and uh, one had severe burns up her throat. Her bib had caught on fire, and the other girl had a similar but separate incident with burns down her arm and huge pots on the end of her hands. and and. Uh, President Kennedy stopped and uh, he said, I'd like to write a note to the children. 
So the nurse scurries to the station and gets the name of the children and Kennedy writes a note to each child. He just did this spontaneously. And he said, I, can you see they get this? And there was no fanfare, there was no photo op, uh, there was no press release or anything. It was just a matter of empathy and concern for someone else. And then we uh, proceeded down the hall to uh, see his son, who, of course, died the next day. This was part of the dichotomy of the man. You could see so many qualities that just glowed that you couldn't see why he wanted to follow other roads that were so destructive. Hey, and I'll explain that to you. Um, Seymour Hirsch wrote a book in the 90s entitled The Dark Side of Camelot, and it was a book about things that President Kennedy really didn't do very well. Uh, not being real faithful to his wife, uh, some things that he probably was very presidential that weren't picked up in those days because the media was a lot different. And uh, this video that you see there is, a, is called uh, The Dark Side of Camelot, and we'll give you a chance to watch that when the time's right to uh, kind of explain that the president was went down in history more in legend because of his death and maybe some of the things that would have came out if he would have lived, okay, because there were some things going on. All right, let's move on to then the setup for the assassination. The reason I show you that thing on Patrick Bouvier Kennedy is because Mrs. Kennedy is going to be out of the picture a little bit here, recovering both physically and emotionally from this. And so his greatest asset or ally really hasn't been with him much from this point on until his trip to November. We'll kind of explain that to you. But the first subtopic when we set ourselves up for the assassination of President Kennedy is the mending of political fences in Texas. And this kind of sets up why in the world he went to Texas anyway, okay? He doesn't go to Texas, and specifically to Dallas, history changes, maybe. So, mending political fences in Texas. Now, he was elected in November of 1960, right? I mean, just general conjecture of visitation here. And so, what's coming up by September 26th of 1963? What? What? Re-election. So he started to make some plans to run for president again, okay? And so he's got to mend some political fences because where is he from geographically? The North. And why does he have Lyndon Johnson maybe as his vice presidential candidate? Because he needs support South. And he's getting some heat in the South, okay, right now. He's thinking it's going to maybe make a difference in his campaign to be re-elected. And he's also got some other issues that he's got to take care of. So on September 26th of 1963, he announces that he's going to take a trip to the state of Texas because he was thinking about this upcoming re-election campaign of 1964. So he makes it public on September 26th of 1963 that President that he is going to take a trip to Texas. Now, if you look at this in perspective, this isn't really the reason he's going to give publicly that he's going. Let me rephrase that. He's going to give a little different reason than political reasons. But the fact of the matter was he needed to take time out of his Washington schedule to mend some political fences in the state of Texas. There's 25 important electoral votes at the time in Texas, and he really believes that he might find himself in a tight race for re-election, and he's going to want to ensure that Texas goes to his cause. And so uh, there, are li there are liberal and conservative wings in Texas. In the, within the Democratic Party, and they're not getting along very well. And if he knows that if he has uh, liberals and conservatives not getting along in Texas within the Democratic Party, that that hurts his chances to win that state. Everybody's got to get along for this to work within the party. So this 25 important electoral votes is on his mind. Now, the people that were struggling with each other within those two factions of liberals and conservatives were actually the three most important politicians in Texas. So not only was it bad that people weren't getting along, it included the three most important political figures in the state. One was Vice President Johnson. Okay, He was one that was in the middle of this, I call it adult drama. Okay, He was one in the middle of this. Would he be considered liberal or conservative? 
Johnson. Very conservative. Okay? Now, Johnson was very close to Texas Governor John Connolly, who's on your ID sheet. So those two are in agreements in their viewpoints. But the person that they're struggling with is a very powerful Democratic senator by the name of Ralph Yarborough. And Yarborough is a liberal. And Johnson and Connolly, the governor, are kind of clashing with Senator Ralph Yarborough. They're all Democrats, keep in mind, kids, but, but Johnson and Connolly are conservative and Yarborough is liberal. Okay? And Johnson's mad at Yarborough anyway. And he's kind of poking at Connolly to get, hey, let's get after this guy a little bit. Maybe we can get this guy unseated. Okay? So Connolly and Johnson are kind of, they're friends, they're both conservative. And Johnson really has a beef with Senator Yarborough. Anybody want to guess why Johnson might not like Senator Yarborough? Now keep in mind, other than the fact they're conservative, well, it might have a little difference if they're conservative or they're liberal, okay? But why do you think he would be upset at Yarborough? Not so much because he's liberal, but what might have happened that made him mad at Yarborough? That goes back to the 60 presidential election. Why might Johnson be mad at Yarborough? Yarborough's a liberal, Johnson a conservative. What was Kennedy? Democratic? Which side of the... Liberal. So what do you think made Johnson mad at Yarborough? What did Yarborough do in the election of 1960? Supported Kennedy. And that ticked off Johnson. And so he felt you should be loyal within your state, right? God dang it. You're a Democrat. You're a senator from Texas. If I want to run for president and I'm from Texas, you need to support me. But he didn't have the same viewpoints as Johnson. And so when the rubber hit the road in the election of 1960, Yarborough supported Kennedy, and that ticked off Johnson. So Johnson was thinking, you know what? we got midterm elections here, or not midterm elections, we've got elections coming up in 64, not only for the presidency, but also for Yarborough's seat. So he gets together with Conley and sees what kind of trouble they can stir up, and maybe they can get another candidate instead of Yarborough to run against him in the primaries and get him unseated. Now, Johnson and Conley would deny that if you would ask him that. But that's really the way Yarborough felt, and it was causing a lot of conflict within the party. So, Kennedy knew that if he had these three people disputing when this upcoming election of 1964 came, that that was going to hurt him and his chances of getting those 25 electoral votes. So, that was probably the biggest reason that he went to Texas in the first place, was to get those three guys together and say, listen... This isn't going to work. We're going to, you're going to get along until at least after the election, and we're going to go from there. And you know what, Lyndon? You and Connolly are going to support Yarborough in re-election. We're not going to have any hassles in the state of Texas because I need the 25 electoral votes because I think this election is going to be closer than we think. So as a result of that, on November 1st of 1963, Press Secretary Pierre Salinger announced publicly to the nation that the president would be traveling to both Florida and Texas during the month of November. So Salinger gets in front of the media and he says the president will, making a, will be making a specific trip to both Florida and Texas in November. When they ask Salinger the purpose of the trips to Florida and Texas, do you think he said because the president's going to go down there and mend some political fences? You think he told them that? No. They made up another reason why he went down there. He went down there to inspect military installations in both states. That was the excuse given why the president was going to Florida and also to Texas. Why was Florida thrown on the agenda? as part of this smoke screen so people didn't really know why he was going down there. Okay, He's going to go to Florida, inspect these military installations, and then he's going to move on to Texas and do the same thing in different cities. Okay, That was the plan. That, that whole thing makes up uh, mending political fences in Texas and also tells you why he was going. Okay, 
So he's going to go to Florida first. So the next subtopic in this prelude is the Florida agenda. What exactly is he going to do in Florida? Now I want to back up and tell you this before we get into, into this new thing. Along with these ins inspections, he's obviously, it's campaign season. What else is he going to do in Florida and Texas? Campaign. campaign. Give speeches and have motorcades. And the plan was to give speeches and have motorcades in five cities in each state. Five speeches and motorcades in Florida and five speeches and motorcades in Texas. So the president's agenda would include the inspections of military installations in both Florida and Texas, but he also would be giving speeches and having motorcade tours in five cities in each of the two states. Okay, that's his plan. That's what went out to the public. But you know he's going to do that, but he's also going to get those fellows together in Texas. So here's the Florida agenda. He went in mid-November... And here's three basic things he did. He watched the firing of a Polaris missile from a nuclear submarine. Okay, test firing. Okay, he watched the test firing of a Polaris, Polaris missile from a nuclear submarine. So one of the general things he did when he got there in mid-November is he watched the firing of a Polaris missile from a nuclear submarine. Just a test. That's part of the military installation gig. Okay? Second thing he did is, we talked about, he got to the business of campaigning in the state. Got to the business of campaigning. That's another general reason why he was there to campaign. He was there to inspect military.